But first this morning, the current Sunday night drama on RT1 television is The Boy That Never Was. It's about a toddler, Dylan, whose parents, Harry and Robin, are living in Morocco when an earthquake strikes. Dylan is missing, presumed dead, and his parents return to Ireland, where a few years later, Harry thinks he spots his missing son on a dart station platform. Well, Harry's played by Colin Morgan, who also starred in Kenneth Branagh's Belfast, in The Fall with Jamie Dorn. Morning, in The Killing Kind and The Crown. And he still has an ardent fan base from his time as Merlin in the BBC series. And Colin also takes a lead role in Dead and Buried, another drama that's going out at the moment on BBC Northern Ireland and Virgin Media. Colin Morgan, good morning to you. Good morning, Miriam. How are you? I'm great. Jeez, you're the man of the moment. You're everywhere. But before <laughs> we get into the Moroccan role, Remind me, tell me a bit about you. I know you grew up in Armagh. Your star has been steadily rising since playing Merlin. But tell me about yourself and your upbringing. Yeah, I mean, I was very lucky to, um, I guess, grow up in a place that had a few outlets for a creative wee boy like me. We had our, the Armagh Theatre Group was absolutely flying and always would have their uh, Christmas shows, which they opened up to lots of the kids to get involved in. So I probably ended up being on stage with them um, in their Christmas shows and pantomimes very early on. I'm thinking probably five or six. It was uh, it was early days, and yeah, that was it. I just it was in me from a young age. I was always someone who just had this natural um, interest and and ability, I guess, uh, to. To perform, so in a lot of ways, when I'm asked about inspirations or or anything like that, I I don't feel like I chose to get into the game. I feel like it sort of chose me, and and I've just been trying to to obey it <laughs> <laughs> for for most of my life, and just very very lucky that I'm able to do it as an adult as well. But not much has changed really from that five year old, if I'll be honest. <laughs> oh, that's so nice. And your parents, they're not in the business, are they? What do they do? I, I don't have anyone who's in the game, actually. So it's all quite new to everyone, even, you know, my friends back home. But I think that's a, that's a thing in the, in you know, I guess whenever I was growing up, there weren't a lot of opportunities. As we know, Ireland is absolutely booming at the minute with, with things coming over to film. And um, I think a lot of us here in this game are like, well, it's about time. You know, we're a, we're a nation of storytellers, of people who enjoy telling stories, of who appreciate culture. And have, we've got it in our blood. And now it seems like the the rest of the world's kind of getting in on the secret. I just hope they don't do any uh, yeah. <laughs> any secrets and and uh, whatever. Must but I think we're we're doing well and we're and we're um, I think we're putting the place on the map. You were interested, therefore, in acting, as you say, Colin, from being a five year old boy. But what was your trajectory into actually getting into acting as a career later on? So whenever I was growing up, I suppose there was always going to be a point where you could where you would have to leave the country if you wanted to take things further at least that's how i felt um i studied an acting course up in belfast institute uh when i was 16 till 18 and then i was going to take a year out before doing some auditions for all the drama schools over in London. I was going to do them, or in England, and I was going to do them all. Um, But I thought, uh, before taking that year out, I would audition for one drama school to know what the experience was like. I auditioned for the Royal Scottish Academy uh, in Glasgow, which is now called the Royal Conservatoire Scotland. Mm -hmm. And um, and I got offered a place. (laughs) (laughs) So I had all this money saved up from washing cars with my brother and um, working in the cinema and working in my film station at all this money, which um, I was going to put towards traveling, um, which ultimately went towards uh, drama school. And I just went. And I think that was, that was, you know, who knows the way things pan out. Um, but I guess the timing of everything just seemed right. I went there. I did three years on that course. Um and just so happened in our final year when we were down in London doing the showcase, which is where you do a performance for all the agents and cast and directors and you hopefully get signed. They were casting for a, a play in London um, called Vernon God Little, which is an adaptation mm. of a book with the same title. And um, 
casting director saw me at the showcase, got me in to meet the director, and I landed the lead role in this production in London, and that was my first job. I did I did then two other productions afterwards um, in London on stage at the Old Vic and then back again at the Young Vic before any filming came along. That was so great. And as you said a moment ago, Colin, you know, Irish actors, you're really enjoying the moment, huge recognition. But I was wondering, thinking of you, do you feel that in a sense you're from Armagh, you're almost flying a flag for Northern Ireland in particular, that you're part of telling a new narrative for the place? I think so. I'm really incredibly proud to be from Northern Ireland. A lot of my first jobs, in fact, you know, early on in the game, I, I was being asked actually to lose my accent, to do a different accent. Um, a lot of times, all the jobs I did to begin with, um, I do interviews and people are so surprised I was Northern Irish because I was either having to um, do an English accent because that's what was required and maybe people were a little uncomfortable with, I suppose, the Northern Irish accent can bring up certain images mm-hmm. in people's heads you know because of the legacy because of 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 the images we saw on tv married with the accent somehow i think maybe made people nervous um that's changed thankfully you know accentism is 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 mm-hmm. just a thing as as anything else i think a lot of people are experiencing it um, in any of the regional areas but uh but thankfully now, yeah, I mean it's 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 amazing when I mean, you think of things like uh film Belfast, which which to see yes, something deal with um that time period, but to be told in such a kind of hopeful, um relatable way that has touched the hearts of people all over the world, to kind of have a universal positive uh message from a place of such a universal universally sort of negative message which we you know is 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 such a turnaround and makes me feel really proud you know and the fact now that um people want to hear the accent in programs and that programs are getting made at home and we're not shying away from the fact that it is ireland there's many times things have been shot in ireland as somewhere else mm-hmm. now we're, we're saying no this is ireland these are irish people and this is their voice this is how they talk and this is who they are and i think we should be proud of that yeah, God, that's so interesting. Now, look, episode three of The Boy That Never Was, it's going out tonight, RT1. Tell us a little bit about Harry and what happens to his family when this earthquake strikes, Colm. Harry is a man who I think he's he's in the midst of tremendous grief. I think we can't imagine the absolute depths of what it is to not only lose a child in 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 such a uh horrific way but to never find the body to never see and never know for sure and to always have some niggling doubt in your mind um you know grief's a funny thing your your body often needs to see the presence um of a body and see the absence of life to help with the process but when you don't get that experience, I suppose there's just always some mental um, aspect to hanging on for hope. And I think that's something Harry has always existed in. And as, an, as a visual artist, he's kept his son alive through pictures and sketches and paintings, um, literally aging his son as he might have been each year on his birthday. He completes a portrait which would be his son at five as he would at six. He knows he was Mm. at seven and then suddenly there's an instance where Harry believes he's seen his actual son in real life as he would be. He's aged him in his head and now he sees him before him. And I think there's there's absolute questions between what what could be real, what could be conspiracy and what could just be a man go in the throes of trauma and grief, unprocessed grief. Yeah, it's really powerful. I think it's based on, obviously, that Karen Perry novel. When you first got the script, what did you think? I was absolutely drawn into, I suppose, the, I suppose it's the strong emotions that it, that it naturally provokes. I think, I think seeing an Irish couple trying to make a life in such a, in such a new place and to have it so devastatingly taken away and to then have to return to life a life that you thought you'd left behind. Those are the things that I think were were, were fascinating for me. 
Um, little did we know that two weeks before we were going to, we were going to go out to Morocco, that one of the biggest earthquakes to hit the country had hit there and killed, I believe, over 6,000 people in the end. Mm. So having prepared ourselves in the fictional world of the boy that never was, um, suddenly the reality of what we had been creating for ourselves was all over the news. And then we were going to that country miles away from where the disaster hit to shoot just exactly the same scenario. I don't know. It was it was a, it was a loss, you know. It was it was uh, <laughs> it it felt suddenly felt. Um, first of all, it was like, is it right to, to to proceed? And then and then I think I think then it became vitally important that we did certainly to the Moroccan crew that we were about to go and work with, many of whom had been had been uh, affected by the earthquake, many of whom had actually been on the rubble, you know, mm. pulling bodies from the rubble. Would, in fact, some of them be on our set? on rubble, pulling extras from rubble around us. Um, I, I, don't, I just don't know how some of them were, were, were doing this, but the Moroccan people are this incredible energy, this incredible spirit of, I, I, I don't know where they, where they get it from, this kind of idea of uh, doing good and, and, and karma and there being a good in any bad situation. They just had this feeling within them. Um, so to be surrounded by that, while we were doing such a traumatic story, um, coupled with the reality of the trauma, it was actually one of the most uh, sort of joyous um, shooting experiences I've had, if I can put it that way. Mm -hmm. It was just, I don't know, we, we had, oddly, a lot of laughter and camaraderie and bonding and uh, positivity. Uh, which I think you might watch this and think, gosh, that must have been that must have been harrowing to film. Yes, it was, but in but when the cameras called cut, there was even more of a need to to, mm. to not live in that. And I just felt that that was the it was just an incredible shooting experience with an incredible team. Certainly, one I would put it right up there with maybe one of the most rewarding I've ever had. You're also, of course, as I said at the beginning, in Dead and Buried on Monday nights. Um, two doses of Colin Morgan in the one week. That's great as well. Tell us a little about Michael <laughs> McAllister. Yeah, I mean, I, I I saw the release dates of these things and I, I was thinking, these people are going to be sick of the sight of me. <laughs> um, but no, Dead and Buried, again, a completely different different show entirely, much more of a, a darkly twisted, um, almost comic tale um but rooted much more in the legacy of trauma um, that exists in Northern Ireland, but absolutely not tied to Northern Ireland. In this story, it follows Cathy, whose brother was uh, murdered um, when he was a teenager, uh, in which Michael McAllister is implicated in and imprisoned for, for whatever his involvement was. It's quite a thing to for a, char a character like Cathy to believe that her brother's murderer is put away and punished and put that to rest. Quite another thing when you see that man 20-odd years later in the supermarket doing a shopping with his family and seeming to have a happy enough life, mm. um, which she didn't know about. What that brings up, what as the title suggests, isn't quite dead and buried and um, things do come to the surface. What's their unfinished business? So uh, Kathy's a woman who has, who has unfinished business and Michael McAllister, who I play, is, is a man who I guess is unfinished in general. Again, uh, a character that presents me with many, many uh, challenges and many um, psychological um, facets to to try and shine a light on and often when you shine lights on those a whole other facet gets reflected somewhere else and you have to walk down there and find out what that's all about and those are always the characters that I'm most interested in the ones that you never really ever fully get the answer to. Yeah they're both fascinating the ones you're doing at the moment that means people are getting far more aware of you you're incredibly striking as well Colin how do you deal with increasing fan, I suppose, attention, recognition? Um, I suppose I've got better at it over the years because I, I, I suppose I was used to doing uh, theatre and, as I described, you know, my first 
productions were all just going to the theatre. I was used to just, you know, getting the tube in London, getting warmed up, doing doing my thing on stage, going home. Uh, that all changes a bit when you end up doing a bit of TV, and then maybe you go back to my first theatre job after after that. I, you know, it was then I guess people coming to see you on stage, you know, for different reasons because you were that guy that saw on TV and. Um, they wanted to meet you and on this idea of um I, you know i don't like you know this this kind of fame word um which you know does come as a, a part and parcel with the job but i suppose it's never the thing you're quite thinking about until it starts happening and then i just happen to be the type of person who's a bit low key but but bit more to myself and 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 uh and didn't know how to deal with that and i suppose that's early days i might have just been a bit more like that, you know, and trying to keep the head down. And now, if someone comes up to me and and, and says they recognise me, you know, I, like I thank them, and 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 it does actually make my day when when somebody is being um, positive and they're and they're and they and they appreciate what you do, or they just say love your work, and mm. and yeah, like that's that's really nice, isn't it? You know, mm. and 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 um, I've, I've just I think I've got a bit better about ex, you know accepting that and and realising people are people are just wanting to support you, and um, you know nobody's really coming up and, you know, throwing eggs at you, but, you know, <laughs> yet. <laughs> no, they never will. Yeah, but when that, you know, if or when that happens, then I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you and we can talk to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, just final question. I suppose you're probably on to your next project already, are you, Colin? What, what are you planning next? Uh, yeah, I have. I've just shot something over the summer here um, that will be on one of the streamers next year. And uh, because of all these NDAs and everything you have mm. to sign, uh, the fear <laughs> of God is in me to actually mention anything about it. Um, but that will be on screen next year. And uh, and yeah, um, various uh, possibilities um, which hopefully in the next little while will become clear to me as, as much as anyone else. Sorry to be so cryptic but um, mm-hmm. but I don't even have the answers myself just yet. So. <laughs> I totally get it. Well look, Colin Morgan, Armagh's famous son. Thanks so much for chatting <laughs> to me this morning and the third episode of The Boy That Never Was is going out tonight, RT1 TV and anyone can catch up of course in the first two episodes on the RT player. Delighted with all your success Colin, best of luck for the future. Uh, thanks a million, really appreciate all the support and I uh, hope you enjoy the, the episode tonight. Thanks so much Colin, take care.